I think that's actually one of the key outcomes of this study for Lonnie and I was, what are we going to say about this? Once you have that, like your, your own question and that passion and it drives you, it's an indescribable feeling. That's what ASN Kidney Translation Podcast is all about, is how do we take these bindings and apply it to our patients? I fully expected to find no results. Welcome to the inaugural episode of the ASN Kidney Translation Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Matthew Sparks, a nephrologist at Duke University, also serving as a communications editor for the ASN portfolio of journals, Jason, Kidney360, and C. Jason. Our mission is to deliver insights from the latest advances in kidney medicine and engage in a meaningful discussion on how these breakthroughs will directly impact patient care. In this first episode, we delve into nephrotoxins. Joining us are two guests, Dr. Walsh and Dr. Pine, to unpack their recent paper published in Jason, shedding light on the relationship between proton pump inhibitors and kidney outcomes. Additionally, we have the privilege of hearing from Dr. Mansour, who will enlighten us on a brief communication featured in Kidney360 addressing a concerning incident involving potential ethylene glycol contamination of cough syrup. This resulted in severe acute kidney injury in Uzbekistan. And that's not all. Dr. Mansour will also guide us through an original investigation in C. Jason, exploring the intricacies of acute kidney injury associated with antiviral agents for the treatment of herpes zoster. Join us on a journey into the forefront of kidney medicine, where groundbreaking research meets real-world patient impact. So I have two guests, the senior author, Dr. Michael Walsh. Could you please introduce yourself? Hi, Matt. Mike Walsh here. I'm an associate professor at McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada. And Dr. Lonnie Pine. Hi there, Matt. My name's Lonnie Pine. I'm a nephrologist and assistant professor at uh, McMaster University. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and just talk about the problem in general. This was first seen in observational studies where there could be an increased incidence of CKD in patients that are on PPIs versus H2 blockers. I think the first studies were out of a VA population, and that was actually repeated in a second cohort. Can you tell us more about sort of the background for how you got to where you are with your current study? A lot of this observational literature linking PPIs to a variety of adverse outcomes from a kidney perspective, chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease. And so the interest was one of the first large-scale randomized controlled trial of actually randomizing people to pentoprazole versus a placebo. And so helped to sort of address some of the shortcomings um, that are um, inherent to the observational literature. And it was just to use the randomized controlled trial data that we have to try to kind of see if we're finding a similar signal or, to be honest, I fully expected to find no results. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, sometimes you're surprised. What was your practice like when you're seeing patients that were on PPIs in the CKD clinic? Obviously, before you started the study back 2020, before that, My own personal practice, I found I was busy enough with sort of high yield things to do in clinic that uh, this was not something that I was routinely doing. If I had some patients that were complaining of polypharmacy, that was a a common one I'd be looking at, mostly because it's a common medication many times without a good indication. So if it's a particular complaint of patients, it's something I may be looking at to stop um, if they're just upset by their pill burden, but not really something I was going out of my way. I found that the regular clinical care was taking up more than enough of the full clinical encounter to not have time to spend on something that I, prior to this, viewed as, I would have termed it a nephrologist taking this on as a little to no value care. I think in my practice, maybe many practices, particularly where we have pharmacists um, embedded into some of the care of, of at least some patient populations we have, we uh, we kind of, much like you said, the evidence has ebbed and flowed for PPIs and kidney outcomes. The desire to stop prescriptions that people don't need has also ebbed and flowed in our practices. And so there's times in my practice when I've taken it on with zealous joy to try and discontinue every medication that we thought was not that useful, which was fine. And many patients went fully into it. But we noticed that there was a lot of patients coming back on their PPIs for their return visits, particularly in the what we call our uh, multi-care kidney clinic or the MCKC, where we do a lot of what is considered pre-dialysis care. And uh, we go like, oh, what's up with that? 
And people go, my heartburn was really bad after this. So you told me that you're not really sure if it does me any good or evil. And so I'm pretty sure it causes me heartburn when I get rid of it. So I wanted to go back on. I think I feel similar when I first heard about some of these association studies. It's like, well, if anything I can do to help them, I might as well. And if there was no compelling reason to be on the medication, then why not try to get rid of it? But then that always there's downstream consequences, like you said, if they have reflux that maybe they hadn't really had in many years, they might say that they don't have reflux anymore. That's because they're on the PPI. So I think it was very challenging to know what the right thing. And the other thing I'll say is that since we've had all these new medications like SGLT2 inhibitors, now GLP-1 receptor agonists, and trying to use and counsel them for those, it's becoming, you have less time to, to talk about things like PPI. So I think sort of lost a little steam and sort of thinking about this. And so now we know that there's association study. Before we go into this, the trial, why would PPIs actually lead to CKD? Like what's the mechanistic insight to that? So at least traditionally, at least the known association that I think probably, I think it's fair to say most nephrologists would agree with is a pretty strong um, link to clinically overt acute interstitial nephritis. I think whether it's from large case series or some interesting case studies where patients actually get acute interstitial nephritis, subsequently get exposed to a PPI, get a second case of acute, acute interstitial nephritis, I think it's pretty convincing that they certainly can cause an overt clinically relevant acute interstitial nephritis. In terms of other mechanisms, there's everything from increased vascular calcification to altering the gut microbiome to basically lots of things that have been suggested. I'm on the simplistic side and seeing that relationship between acute interstitial nephritis my question, at least the mechanism I always thought in mind would have been maybe there's a chronic interstitial nephritis and we're just seeing the one we see that's clinically evident is just the tail end of that where it's in its most extreme form. Right. So there's maybe a subclinical chronic interstitial nephritis that we just don't pick up on for whatever reason. Well, let's go ahead and talk about the study. This is a study from a randomized clinical trial in the cardiology space called the COMPASS trial. There was already some data surrounding CKD that was already published several years ago. Can you tell us about, one, how you got linked to this randomized clinical trial? Now we have another study looking at kidney function, but yet there was already some literature from this randomized clinical trial about PPIs. Can you tell us about the COMPASS trial and just how this all started? So this is a partial factorial study where initially the primary uh, mover of the study was looking at rivaroxaban versus rivaroxaban plus aspirin versus aspirin alone and looking at cardiovascular outcomes in people with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, namely coronary artery disease or peripheral arterial disease. But as a partial factorial in the sense that some of the patients were randomized to a PPI, namely pantoprazole or placebo, trying to see if it would uh, prevent um, the anticipated adverse event of an intervention like that of, of bleeding. This trial was run out of the Population Health Research Institute, or PHRI, a research institute here in Hamilton, Ontario. And initially, as part of my master's, I was looking at the kidney outcomes from the rivaroxaban and aspirin side of it, looking at anticoagulant-related nephropathy. That work is still in progress. And uh, as part of that, I sort of looped in looking at the other arm of the study, looking at the pantoprazole versus placebo to see, to try to get some information on whether or not PPIs were uh, worsening kidney outcomes. This was a very large um, study, almost 27,000 participants. And you mentioned there are three arms, rivaroxaban by itself, rivaroxaban plus aspirin or aspirin alone. And mm -hmm. there are patients that have risk of cardiovascular disease. So they either have cardiovascular disease or atherosclerotic vascular disease and looking at the primary outcome of cardiovascular death, stroke, or myocardial infarction. What was the results of this COMPASS trial, the primary results? Yeah, so the primary results were uh, published in the New England Journal in 2017, but they found that there was a significant improvement or a decrease in the uh, primary outcome in those that were in the rivaroxaban plus aspirin group, has a ratio of 0.76, 
p-value of less than 0.001. They did also find that there was a statistically significant increase in the rate of major bleeding hazard ratio 0.7, um, namely 3%, about 3% versus 2% in the rivaroxaban plus aspirin group, improving cardiovascular outcomes and increase in bleeding risk. Just want to be clear about the methods here. So these are 27,000 patients were randomly assigned at these three groups. From what I also read, the, the study was terminated early for efficacy, at least the rivaroxaban portion of it. If patients were not on a PPI coming into the trial, then they were randomized to either a PPI or placebo. How many got randomized into a PPI versus placebo? As you mentioned, everybody who was not on a PPI baseline was then either randomized to pantoprazole or placebo. And those that were on a PPI baseline, reflecting you know how common these medications are used nowadays, so about a third of the 27,000 were not randomized to pantoprazole versus placebo. So about 9,000 were on a PPI baseline. Those were excluded from the pantoprazole versus placebo randomization, which left us with about 9,000 randomized to pantoprazole and about 9,000 randomized to placebo. How did they deal with the fact that the rivaroxaban portion was stopped early and then the pantoprazole portion was continued? At that point of stopping for efficacy, patients were taken off of their assigned to rivaroxaban or aspirin, and then that portion of the trial was ended, but they continued through to the planned follow-up for the uh, pantoprazole uh, placebo randomization. In total, that resulted in a mean follow-up of about three years um, for the uh, pantoprazole um, placebo arm of the trial. Yeah, can I interject some color commentary? I think the first answer with how did they deal with the early stopping in the rivaroxaban arm was with great difficulty. As you can imagine, the Compass was a big machine to run. And so part of how we got started with this is one of my offices is next door to John Eichelboom and Jackie Bosch's. John and Jackie were the, the leads behind Compass. John's a thrombosis expert with an interest in cardiovascular outcomes. And Jackie is actually an PhD occupational therapist with a long, long history in cardiovascular research. And so as they were getting this machine ramped up into full steam, which was recruiting over 900 patients a week, and our office, wow. my office is right outside the coordinating component of it, and we share a project manager, they, they get this news that they've got to stop recruitment and deal with how do you stop 27,000 patients medication safely and with follow-up and ensuring in some jurisdictions that they have continued access to medication and still continue another 17,000 patients on a different medication at the same time while not interrupting data flow. So a really challenging time logistically for them. Um, and I think, you know, we, we get into this, why, why were the kidneys just like not such a priority? Like, well, it's pretty tough actually, uh, just doing the one job that you were tasked to at the beginning thinking about other things down the road when you're trying to follow up 27,000 patients at one time can be quite the challenge. So uh, I will say cut them a little bit of slack on not having their eyes on the kidney prize at the time. That's an interesting, such a large study. A, a couple of things come to mind, and maybe this is about just the difference between the data that you get from observational studies versus randomized clinical trials. For If you were to explain to uh, a new fellow about how to read randomized clinical trials and observational studies, what are the big benefits of this database you have here compared to uh, what was previously published with PPIs and CKD outcomes? Yeah. I mean, if I were to explain that, I would say, if you just think of your own clinical practice, the people who we give a PPI to, it is done for reason. It is done for cause. It is, and they are fundamentally different from the people that don't get exposed to a PPI in some ways that we can measure and probably in a multitude of ways that we can't measure. And that's if we measure them appropriately, if we record them properly. So that sort of the gets to some of the um, inherent shortcomings of the observational literature. I think really the core issue is going to be that those that in regular kind of clinical practice get a PPI are fundamentally different in important ways, in ways that probably associate with worse clinical outcomes from those that don't. And our ability to adjust for those is incomplete. And I think despite our best efforts remains incomplete and this is why randomized controlled trials are so important, because with large enough numbers, both known and unknown factors should be 
balanced between those that got randomized to pantoprazole and those were randomized to placebo. This study was obviously not designed to answer the question that you're asking. It was designed to ask the question on the PPI portion about GI bleeding. The number of patients that were recruited, all these factors are going into that primary outcome. How do you then switch gears and talk about a different outcome that maybe wasn't even established in the making of this clinical trial. The original New England Journal publication of the rivaroxaban portion was published in 2017. So this was done on a background of knowing all of this multitude of observational literature, linking PPIs to a variety of adverse um, outcomes from pneumonia to fractures to cardiovascular outcomes to mortality to all of the kidney outcomes we already mentioned. So the pantoprazole portion, they did have pre-specified. They were specifically looking not just for efficacy, but they all were also were looking at safety outcomes. And as you had mentioned, there was that paper in the initial safety outcomes of the pantoprazole portion of the trial that was published in Gastroenterology in 2019, sort of looking at specifically the bleeding portion, but looking at all of these multitude of outcomes that PPIs have been linked to in observational studies. What did they show for the CKD side effects in you mentioned that they had a lot of interest in these things. Was kidney disease pre-specified as a point of interest? So in the original safety paper, looking at the safety outcomes for the atoprazole placebo portion, there were a variety of uh, adverse events of special interest. Um, chronic kidney disease was one of those, but that was primarily that definition of CKD was based on someone checking a box to say, this person now has chronic kidney disease. There wasn't a requirement for any particular EGFR recording, so not quite meeting our rigorous standards for what would constitute chronic kidney disease. But at least what was found in that initial paper published in Gastroenterology in 2019 was that in those that were randomized to pantoprazole, the rate of uh, chronic kidney disease uh, was about 2.1%. Um, and in those randomized to placebo, um, the rate of chronic kidney disease as they defined it was 1.8% for an odds ratio of 1.17 and a 95% confidence interval from 0.94 to 1.45, p-value of 0.15. So not meeting conventional statistical significance, but if you sort of get away from the black and white, yes or no interpretation of clinical trials, you start to look at, we're not exactly excluding a clinically relevant effect size and was a uh, numeric increase in the rate of chronic kidney disease with the caveat of some um, shortcomings of, of exactly how uh, chronic kidney disease was defined. So you see that result and now tell us about then how your current paper that's published in JSON differs from that, and we can go through sort of the methods to ask the question about CKD and PPI use. I think a lot of this was born out of the really interesting and incredibly impactful surrogate validation studies on looking at rate of GFR decline that have been published over the last couple of years. Those I found to be incredibly interesting. And the idea was to use a even more sensitive outcome, if possible, to see if we can pick up any effect of pantoprazole on kidney outcomes. Obviously, with a non-kidney outcome trial, with a cardiovascular outcome trial, whether it be our traditional uh, clinical kidney outcomes of whether it be doubling of serum creatinine, 40% decrease in EGFR, 50% decrease in EGFR, or even incident chronic kidney disease, these are going to be, numerically, you're not going to have many outcomes to go, for, to go by. So what we were hoping for before sort of diving into what data was actually collected, we were hoping to see that there would be subsequent EGFR measures um, so that we could look at the outcome of choice we were hoping to find. Data for was rate of GFR decline, getting at sort of some of the shortcomings of how CKD was initially defined in that safety paper, but also hoping to pick up an even more sensitive signal for kidney effect. So did they have GFR measurements on all of these patients? So there was a EGFR measurement at baseline for all participants. And at the conclusion of the trial, um, which as I said, was after about a mean follow-up of about three years, um, there was the option of enrollment in uh, a long-term open label extension uh, portion of the trial. And then of those participants that elected to continue on, in the open label extension portion of the trial, which was at about three years after randomization, if they enrolled in that open label extension phase, they then had a subsequent EGFR measure drop. 
And how many had both measures? As mentioned, um, 100% had an EGFR baseline and uh, approximately 50% enrolled in that open label extension phase. And so 50% of the overall population had a subsequent EGFR drawn 3.3 years after randomization. So sort of back to what Mike had said earlier, he said, this is not a CKD trial. I guess to me, I'm like, wow, they didn't have multiple creatinine measurements throughout this study. Is that typical of a lot of these cardiovascular trials? The kidneys don't rate really highly on what they're thinking about. Actually, I was surprised that they wanted to put every patient getting a creatinine done at baseline as part of the, uh, the procedures for the trial. That, I think, was already an outstanding move. That's interesting that you say that because I'm looking at it thinking we should have yearly creatinines on all these participants that we can really get a fine-tuned look at the safety of these medications. So, okay, we started with this huge study of 27,000 patients, and we whittled it down to how many that we're going to look at in this cohort. Slightly larger than any kidney study ever done at 9,218 participants who have had So they're still beating most of our nephrology trials, (laughs) uh, even with all these caveats. Wow. That's, uh, that that gives us a a lot to work for in the field and it, but it is impressive that we do, we are achieving some of these numbers, maybe not 27,000, but we're getting up there in the four to 5,000 range now. So we have about 4,000 in the PPI group and about 4,500 in the placebo group. Is that sort of where we landed? Well, tell us about the baseline characteristics of these patients. Is this the typical group of patients that you'd see in your CKD clinic? Certainly not a a typical group that I would see in my CKD clinic, uh, as evidenced by most of them uh, do not have CKD. We don't have any albuminuria at baseline. That's beyond uh, what we could uh, have uh, hoped for. It would have been nice if we did, but we don't have any albuminuria to get to a greater definition of chronic kidney disease. But the baseline EGFR was about 75. The average age at baseline was about 67. So essentially, you're getting at what amounts to a typical population for your cardiovascular outcome trials. People in their six and seventh decade of life, the EGFR was 75. In terms of having an EGFR of between 30 to 60, we had about 20% of participants in each arm of the trial. And at least for baseline characteristics, one thing I'd like to point out is just the similarity between those randomized to pantoprazole and those randomized to placebo, certainly well-balanced by all measures. And I think that's important to mention because when they were put into that extension, there was sort of potentially another bias that could be created from that. And can you tell us about what the percentage of patients in both groups were that went into that extension phase that got that second creatinine measurement? Whether you look at those that were included in the open label extension, if you look at those that were in the pantoprazole group or those that were in the placebo group, they're quite well balanced. And if you look at those that were excluded from the open label extension, that those that we did not have a subsequent EGFR for, those were also similar to those that were included. And even more important, the pantoprazole and placebo were quite well balanced and really not really any uh, discernible difference between the two arms, whether they're looking at the included or excluded population. Well, if I'm thinking about if I was going to design a clinical trial trying to answer this question, this seem to be fairly low risk of having kidney events, given we don't know the albuminuria, but the GFRs are in the 70 range. So these are not the typical patient that I would necessarily see. What can you say about the power that we have, and I know that this is all we got, you know, so we got to go with what we got. How many patients would you need to really answer this question with this kind of patient cohort? I mean, I guess it would depend greatly on what your anticipated sort of rate of EGFR decline would be. If we're anticipating a, what sometimes get called a, you know, age-related decline of one mil per minute per year, a little bit more because there are patients that have established cardiovascular disease. I think certainly 9,000 is uh, more than we would need to be picking up. So you certainly wouldn't be powering a study for this sort of outcome. I think when you look at kidney outcome trials, looking at rate of EGFR decline, they're looking at specifically recruiting people who have an elevated risk and experiencing much higher rates of EGFR decline. So I think once we're getting into the 10,000 patients, we're able to pick up small effects, and which we certainly have. So I think there's more than enough power to pick up a statistically significant effect and then gets the discussion of what is statistically significant and is it 
clinically significant when right. you start picking up these small effect sizes with such large numbers. And it's also really mind-bending to think about this. We think about most of our clinical trials when you sort of think about it, you're trying to slow the rate of EGFR decline. And this one, you're sort of looking at an enhanced rate of EGFR decline. So like you don't want to design a trial for harm. <laughs> you know, you want to design a trial for benefit. Well, tell us about what the results were. I think that's what we're all waiting to hear. So in terms of the results, if we look at the rate of EGFR decline in the placebo group, we found that they declined at a rate of about 1.41 mils per minute per year. And then the pantoprazole group, their EGFR declined at about 1.64 mils per minute per year. And regardless of how we sliced and diced it, um, uh, adjusted for baseline variables like age, baseline EGFR, things that might be associated with worsening kidney outcomes, we did adjust for those things. We found that there was a 0.27 in an around 0.25 mils per minute per year, greater decline in those randomized to pantoprazole. So the absolute effect size was 0.27, about a quarter of a mil per minute per year greater decline in those randomized to pantoprazole. And in terms of a uh, relative effect size, if you look at how much uh, of an impact that had on the placebo group, that was about a 20% increase in the uh, rate of decline in the uh, as compared to placebo. Well, that's very interesting. As you mentioned, you weren't expecting to find this. If anything, you thought maybe you wouldn't find any difference at all. You sort of really also tried said- hard not to find it. <laughs> we were really trying hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's very surprising. So how can I explain this to a patient to say that it's, uh, you know, 0.26 change or whatever? I, what does that mean clinically? Mm -hmm. We struggle with that with just telling other nephrologists how to think about it, never mind how we communicate that to patients. I think that's actually one of the key outcomes of this study for Lonnie and I was, what are we going to say about this? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, on the one hand, I think it's very reassuring. Patients with a lot of renal residual, maybe they're at advanced ages, maybe this means nothing to them, and they can safely continue on a drug that might be providing them with symptomatic relief. For patients who really are worried about kidney failure and who their providers are really worried about kidney failure, and you want to do everything to protect whatever renal residual they've got left, well, then maybe this is one of those what we thought was low-hanging targets to try and go after. But one of the biggest questions that we were left with was that you know, in a lot of things where we look at benefits, even when it comes to slope GFR, you see relative benefits so that if people are declining at a certain rate and you give them a medication, it decreases the decline in that rate by, say, 20%. So does that mean that in this medication, where the decline in is about 1.41 mils per minute per year in the control arm, that's about, you know, a 20% increase for those mm -hmm. in, the, in the pantoprazole arm? We deal with people who have typically high risk groups of four, four and a half mils per minute per year, maybe even larger for some groups. So if they are on pentoprazole, does that mean that they're going to get a 20% increase, which is 1.2 mils per minute per year potentially for the ultra high risk groups? And that we don't know. And I think the thing that's interesting here is, uh, like you had mentioned, Matt, this is um, not our usual clinical scenario. This wasn't a trial where we were trying to, where we gave people an intervention to improve the rate of EGFR decline. We're looking at a toxicity of exposure. And then Mike and I have had conversations back and forth about this dozens of times. Does the effects seem to be um, relative that if it causes a 20% worsening in low risk, it should cause a 20% worsening in high risk. Does that necessarily translate over to a toxic exposure? You know, I think there's uh, arguments to be made on either side, and really that remains unanswered. Back to how we were talk talking about the mechanism earlier, and you would think in a, this many patients, you would have a signal for AKI and interstitial nephritis. Was that seen? Yeah, so we didn't see a significant increase in the outcome of acute kidney injury, with the caveat of this was not a kidney outcome trial, AKI was not a pre-specified outcome. This was defined, this AKI was defined on case report forms. Essentially, somebody said this patient was hospitalized with, and they had a, a kidney injury. So we weren't really seeing that signal. And I think that's something that had been seen in the observational literature as well, where even in those that don't get a clinically overt acute kidney injury, you were seeing some increase, still seeing some increased risk without intervening AKI, increased risk of in chronic kidney disease 
And certainly at the rates that we were seeing, if this is sort of some, you know, small increase, or relatively small increase, our rate of far decline, they may never actually meet the definition of an acute kidney injury. And it's just, you know, a process going on in the background. I did find it interesting that in terms of the actual clinically overt acute nephritis, there was a total of one event in the uh, pantoprazole group. And I think that consistent with some of the population research that we've seen where the rates of while PPIs are a common cause of acute interstitial nephritis, PPIs do not commonly cause acute interstitial nephritis. It is, uh, they're just medications that we use so broadly that so many patients are being exposed to them that it's one of the more common causes. I get fellows all the time that they see patients with acute kidney injury and they see they're on a PPI and they're quick to blame that. And I was like, you know, there's a lot more common things going on. It's in the, it's in the realm. If you look at large nationwide studies from like New Zealand or Sweden, where they have complete data collection, it's about like one per 10,000 patient years of exposure. So, you know, these acute nephritis episodes from PPIs, it's just, they're incredibly rare. We only see them because millions upon millions of people are on PPIs. A few years ago, I think I tweeted out this, this comment that PPIs are like little candies that you get when you leave a restaurant. That's how they kind of are in the medical system. And I think Laurie Tomlinson actually took that tweet. It's published now in the paper because every single patient is on it, which is, I think that's why I think as nephrologists, we're sort of like, we're grappling with how to deal with this. And so I think the question I have now is we've had this discussion from the start and how we sort of looked at this. How do we look at this issue now in the nephrology clinic? Should this be one of our parameters that we look at for every patient who's on a PPI? At least for myself, the way I've kind of operationalized it is prior to this, as I said, I viewed a, nef a nephrologist specifically um, making PPI discontinuation a cornerstone of their clinical practice. I used to view that as little to no value care. On the basis of these results, to me, they're practice changing in the sense they've moved it what from what I would term little to no value care to some value care. And I think there's a lot of, I acknowledge there that the word some is doing a lot of heavy lifting in that sentence, but I think that represents the residual uncertainty about what the effect is, whether it is what, you know, personally I would consider pretty mild. If I'm just increasing most patients rate of EGFR decline by 0.25 mils per minute per year, you know, that's on an individual level, it's probably not going to make a big difference. Whereas if I'm increasing their rate of EGFR decline by 20%, I mean, that's pretty similar to the effect size you get from putting people on, on RAS blockade. So um, it's something that I now pay some attention to, and I have residual uncertainty about how much of my time I should be devoting to this. So after I've got their blood pressure under control and on, you know, guideline directed medical therapy, their RAS blockade and their SGLT2 inhibitor as indicated, as may be indicated, then I start considering those other things, such as looking at giving a uh, suspicious glance to the PPI and looking whether or not they have an indication to remain on it. Lonnie, I don't know if we should let you continue promoting your own paper if you're going to say it went from little or to no impact to some, <laughs> although I do totally agree with your approach. I, you know, I think that you said for some people, this might matter a lot. I really like uh, your <laughs> attitude towards this. Uh, and I think my ebb and flow has flowed back after seeing the results of this paper. Congratulations on a really well done um, article. Before we leave, though, I want to know what's the next step in the saga of PPIs and CKD. Yeah, at least in terms of motivating next steps for me, it's sort of primed me to consider what is clinically relevant, what is patient important. And if you start looking at these outcomes like rate of EGFR decline, how do we communicate these things to patients? So at least for me, it's spurred on some additional research in terms of next steps that I'd like to see that I think really this needs to be replicated in a kidney population and a population that is experiencing much higher rates of EGFR decline. I think there is residual uncertainty about what that effect size is in though in high risk individuals. And I think that's where I think the next steps should be a randomized controlled trial enrolling people at, you know, elevated risk, experiencing much higher rates of EGFR decline than 1.5 mils per minute per year. Because those are the patients that are much likely to end up on dialysis. And those are the ones where uh, we need to do everything we can, potentially, including getting them off of PPIs if they're not indicated. Now, thinking back to this study, though, the PPI portion of the trial, we didn't really talk about the outcome. That was negative. Is that correct? The bleeding outcomes yeah, in, and in, in the COMPASS trial? 
So if you looked at a more broadly defined gastrointestinal bleeding, it was negative. They did sort of look at various outcomes. If you looked at actual like bleeding, duodenal ulcers and things like that, much more narrowly defined bleeding outcomes, there was a slight decrease, but it was um, surprising how few of those outcomes there were. I always find that this trial is in some ways the, the most unique thing about it is no one had ever really done a big trial of using PPIs to prevent gastric ulcer or duodenal bleeding in patients. You know, it's there, they never really received an indication for that. And we use it for these other things that we think are very logical extensions of the whole post peptic ulcer bleeding use of PPIs and uh, the prevention of Barrett's esophagus and things. But we don't really know what the absolute benefits for these are, which is again, why I think if you have reasonable evidence that there might be a bit of harm, it's pretty easy to swing back to the, well, maybe I actually should consider stopping them. And if people have really bad symptoms, we can talk about whether or not this is the right strategy of continued use or, or not. But at least we're going into it a little bit more armed with some knowledge. We often give PPIs to patients that we start on steroids, and these are high-risk individuals. Should we consider H2 blockers in that setting? We probably should. I would have to say, like, I do this all the time because I'm uh, you know, I run a GN practice, so we're using high dose steroids. Right. Like, they're, like they're the candy dispensed instead. And we really struggle with this because you have one bad outcome where, you know, one individual ends up having a fatal or near fatal bleed, and it really colors your practice and your perception of safety. And so Lonnie was saying we really need to do a big trial of either PPI discontinuation or, or initiation. It's really hard to get over some of our practices because the benefits often seem a little bit small or the risks seem very small and our perception of the counter to them is very, very large. So these would be tough trials to do. We, I think we do have to recognize that what we have today may be all we'll ever have to inform these choices. And so what Lonnie said about really thinking about how do we communicate the uncertainty of both the size and existence of some of these effects to clinicians and to patients is really important, uh, as important as the actual result of a, what the medication does or does not do. Are, are there any other examples of randomized clinical trials with PPIs? To, to our knowledge, there is no long-term studies of the use of PPIs, and there is nothing anywhere close to the size of Compass. And nothing on the horizon, like this is sort of an area that's taken its course. Yeah, like these are drugs that have been around for so long that development in them is really not that interesting. One of the ways in that Compass was unique was that it was able to capitalize on an existing trial infrastructure for rifaroxaban to be able to test in this mm -hmm. partial two by two factorial way the PPI question. So this is basically, as far as we can tell, best we're going to get. Unless Lonnie yeah. is uh, really successful with this next part. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. Yeah, I... Thank you to both of you for joining the first episode of ASN Kidney Translation. I really appreciate both of your time and effort. And congratulations on this study, a very important topic for all patients with kidney disease. So thank you very much. Our second half will focus on AKI and also a little bit about viruses. And I have a, I have a friend and colleague, Dr. Sherry Mansour. Please introduce yourself. I'm very excited to be here. So as you said, my name is Sherry. I am an assistant professor at Yale, and I mainly study kidney transplant recipients and cardiovascular disease outcomes. So I'm a clinical and a translational researcher. I'm really interested to hear your view on two articles. We're going to cover one from Kidney360 and another from C. Jason. So let's just go ahead and dive right in and let's talk about this Kidney360 brief communication that looks at AKI in a pediatric group of patients in Uzbekistan. This is a brief communication to Kidney360, and it described this syndrome of AKI and altered sensorium in 50 children all of whom had a febrile upper respiratory infection. And about 36 kids, or 72% of them, received this same combination medicine. Now, we don't have the name of the medicine, but we know it's a combination antipyretic and a cough suppressant. And they found that really the majority, all of them, 49 out of the 50 children developed AKI leading to dialysis, which is 
pretty significant. And 18 of them passed away. And I believe about three, if I'm getting my numbers right, ended up on dialysis without recovery, at least for the follow-up period of the study. It's a pretty significant thing when you see these severe outcomes in kids. And the article was making the argument that this is potentially because of the drug exposure that they had, and they make certain arguments for that. But that's pretty much the summary. I just want to sort of give a little bit more background too. I did a little Googling uh, of this to try to figure (laughs) out like, I mean, the first time I heard about this was from this paper, which as a nephrologist, I feel bad about that. When you Google it, you see all the newspapers that were happening back when this occurred back in 2023. And it's linked to one manufacturer from Marion Pharmaceutical Company. And the name of the two products that were in question was Ambrinol and Doc One Max, apparently. Mm. And they're linked to that one manufacturer. And it's really scary to think that these things are happening and it's in the news, but doesn't really make the national news. And you think as nephrologists, we would be informed by this. Oh, no, absolutely. I was in the same boat. I had no idea about this until I read this article. And this is not just happening in Uzbekistan. There are other under-resourced areas like Nigeria, they mentioned. This has been happening in kids there as well. So there are multiple kids that are ending up in the hospital with pretty bad outcomes after having this URI and being exposed to this combination medication. Um, so so I, I just want to point out a couple of things, Matt. Sorry. And, and maybe I'm being too critical. As nephrologists, that's part, part <laughs> right? of our that's, job. And that's part of the podcast is to yeah. try to be critical. That's, exactly. Exactly. No, that's a criteria for doing nephro fellowship. Are you critical or not? Um, but yeah, so 50 kids, right? About 36 of them were exposed to the drug, but 49 ended up on dialysis. So there's a discrepancy here because we have about 13 kids that weren't exposed to this combination medication that still got dialysis and bad AKI and had a bad outcome. And it's making me think, well, what if it's not really the combination drug here? And if it's just this viral, this there is this new virus that's attacking kids in a severe way and they're getting these bad outcomes. And I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but I I really would have loved to see like a control group or something where kids who got this combination medication and potentially did just fine. Well, what were the clues that were linking it to this cough syrup? The authors do highlight a couple of things. One is that 15 out of the 50 kids had oxalate crystal urea in their urine. And now (laughs) I'm going to laugh a little bit. I mean, you're right. You don't want to see oxalate crystal urea, although it is beautiful. But it's it happens because of multiple different reasons, you know, and we've learned from COVID that a viral infection affects your fat absorption. And when you have fat malabsorption, calcium, unfortunately, doesn't bind to oxalate. It binds to the fat and then you have oxalate being absorbed systemically and it can cause the oxalate crystal urea. So potentially this is all because of the viral syndrome, again, that they're having and not necessarily an exposure to a drug. But what are your thoughts? What they're thinking is that the manufacturers were putting an ethylene glycol into the syrup, I guess, because it's cheaper and you can have more syrup. And so the presumption here is that this oxalate crystal urea is from ethylene glycol toxicity. But I remember when I was a fellow, we had a patient come in with an overdose of Benadryl. And we dutifully looked at the urine and we saw all these crystals, which at first I thought was Benadryl crystals. It turns out uh, they were actually calcium oxalate crystals. (laughs) And um, after doing a little more research, recognized that there's a lot of people, 15% of the population will just have calcium oxalate crystals. And as you mentioned, they can occur from being sick, from pH changes, from different issues that are happening in the hospital. So I think that in of itself, although interesting, the other interesting fact is that they actually had data on that, right. which I, th- that doesn't seem to make the medical record in the United States quite as much. <laughs> I know. I wish we had that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I agree with you. It's hard to link the ethylene glycol just to that. However, it is interesting that they 
um, had that much data on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I do relate to your fascination with urine microscopy because I feel like my first year of fellowship, every urine I saw and I spun, I was like, man, I want to frame this and just put it up in my apartment and decorate my place with it. So <laughs> I, I never actually submitted my oh, paper. <laughs> I, I was considering going to New England Journal of Medicine, Woo-hoo! image image of the week or whatever. Uh, <laughs> never made it out. Well, I mean, someone along the way would have told you this is not Benadryl. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, the other thing that the authors kind of commented on is one of the kids, which to me, that's really the concerning thing. One of the children had high blood ethylene glycol levels. Mm. Now, that no matter what should never be the case. And potentially, I'm concerned that this kid really developed AKI, ended up on dialysis because of a drug exposure. Again, one, but it's still one is too many when you're talking about kids who shouldn't be in the hospital at all. But the other thing is they all had anion gap metabolic acidosis yes. as well. And yes. so then that's another. Uh, the last part is after this happens, going back and looking to see how many syrups were contaminated with ethylene glycol, which should happen before they have these side effects. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this, this, I think, so this is my takeaway from this paper. So even though I, I have my critiques as to really, is this AKI just from the virus or is really the medication contributing to it? But I think the biggest take home message here is that there needs to be better pharmaceutical regulations of drugs. We need to know what's being put out there. We need to see how it's being advertised to kids. And I I didn't know anything about it, to be honest. I was just like, what? How are pharmaceutical companies even regulated? So in the U.S. here, if you are putting out a new drug, clinical trial, you're going to have to report your results. You know, there are regulations, and I believe it's like within six months or so, you got to put your data out there on clinical trials that govern some public interface. And if you don't, they actually email you and they say you're going to be fine $10,000 for every day you're late or something like that. And I, I did like end of one uh, clinical trial and I got that email being the procrast- procrastinator that I am. But Yale, th- thank goodness <laughs> for Yale was on top of me. I was like, you got to put that data in. And I panicked. I really thought I was going to get fine. Then I put that data in. But then I learned that this is not really enforced. No one actually gets fined, at least not that we know of. And this is why pharmaceutical companies actually get away with things. So only 25% of pharmaceutical companies are actually reporting data in a timely manner and being transparent about it. And that's, I think that's a terrible number. And this is here in the U.S. So you can only imagine what's happening in under-resourced countries like Uzbekistan. It's a really challenging area, and when you start to move to drugs like this, cough syrups that are probably not regulated as much as like a pill uh, or something that has FDA approval surrounding it, this is the tip of the iceberg. And yes, this is a group of patients that had very severe severe illness. Uh, Maybe the virus was contributing to the severity, but probably millions or thousands of patients were harmed and we just don't know because we don't know what the long-term implications of exposure was. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I do agree that this is the tip of the iceberg. And I think it's it's not just a problem internationally. I think it's a problem here in the U.S. as well, where we just have to, I think, be astute in, in what drugs are being pushed out there, either by the media. We have to be knowledgeable so that we can educate our patients and empower them. And when it comes to international, I urge the authors to contact this company, find out what's happening. I, I feel like this, it shouldn't end here. Someone needs to take a, an action and a step. And like you said, test the ethylene glycol levels in, in these formulations before you put them out on the market. The last news from the internet looks like the CDC did conclude that it was likely to blame. However, the drug company denies any link at this point. Oh, I'm surprised they denied it. They don't want to pay a fine and shut down. This kind of a great segue to our next paper in C. Jason also has viruses and antiviral medications. Can you tell us a little bit about the second paper we'll discuss? I would love to. So this is a little bit in my wheelhouse. So this is a typical retrospective observational study. 
and it evaluated about 3,000 Chinese patients who were hospitalized and treated for herpes zoster. Now, the majority were admitted for that reason, but there were some, I think about 30% or so, that were admitted for other reasons. And the authors wanted to know if really the incident of AKI differed depending on which antiviral you chose to treat the herpes zoster. And what they found is that the the highest percentage of acute kidney injury happened in patients who received acyclovir or, or val acyclovir compared to the other antivirals. And the other antivirals they 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 looked at are gancyclovir, foscarnet, um, pencyclovir, famcyclovir. <laughs> all the cyclovirs, but the bad guy here turned out to be the acyclovir. And they did the adjusted analyses, but there there are two things I want to point out here is that only about 3.4% of patients developed AKI and the majority of AKI was stage one AKI as defined by Cadigo. So in adjusted analyses, they found that if you were exposed to the other antivirals, you were less likely to develop AKI than if you were exposed to acyclovir, valacyclovir. And the raw numbers is that the incidence of AKI was higher in that group, 5% compared to like 3 versus 1% in the other groups. So let's we'll just go back to that definition of the KDGO classification. You said the majority were stage one. Can you just remind us what the st- Stage one KDGO yeah, uh, sure. AKI mean? So they ignored urine volume. So they just looked at creatinine changes, which is fine. It's really hard to, to get to urine volume, but they pretty much defined it as a 0.3 uh, milligram per deciliter increase in creatinine over 48 hours or a 50% increase in creatinine. So they either definition would have worked. But I mean, to go back to really the clinical implications of that, I mean, as nephrologists, that's not really the AKI we worry about or the AKI we see. The majority of stage one AKI is is really pre-renal. And most of them recover, but unfortunately, one of the limitations I would say is the follow-up here was only seven days. So we don't know what happened to these patients. Did they jump to a higher stage of AKI? Did it last long? Did they end up on dialysis? Did they all recover? And I think that's a really important thing because if you tell me, hey, you know, your patient has herpes zoster, it's so painful and they need to be treated. Yeah, they might get AKI. It's going to be stage one, but they're going to be fine and walk out with their baseline creatinine. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to still use that antiviral to treat them. Can you tell us a little bit about how many were in each category? The majority, 65% or so were stage one AKI and about 16% were stage three and let's say 20% or so were the stage two AKI. So again, as as a nephrologist, the 65% of stage one AKI is is not really even something we get consulted on. Um, These are patients that potentially have pre-renal injury and they recover and do well. The other stages of AKI is what's more concerning and what happened to them is, is kind of unknown because they don't comment about what happens after seven days of the time that the study followed these patients. So did they progress to a higher stage of AKI? Did they recover? That is not really told in this study. You want to be able to have events that you can directly link to antivirals. And one of the problems with having stage one AKI is that it's hard to know what all those fluctuation and creatinine mean and how many are actually directly related to kidney injury from antiviral medication. So maybe only including stage two and stage three might allow you to have a little bit more of a true look, but I guess the numbers are just too small to to do that. Right. Yeah. To just look at stage two and stage three. But I think you bring up a really good point. There potentially could be other contributing factors to why the acyclovir group developed more AKI. And let's look together at table one of the study. I think it kind of highlights, you know, that potentially the group that got the least AKI, the foscarnet, which is kind of opposite from... (laughs) What we see here in the States. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I was thinking about Foscarnet. Anytime we consider using it, we have a multidisciplinary (laughs) rounds and discussions surrounding it. Obviously, this is a, has a high risk of AKI in patients with known CKD, but I guess this cohort's average GFR is in the nineties. Can you talk about why, why would Foscarnet be used so widely? 
Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the, the study actually comments on that. So in China, there are no specific guidelines of which antiviral to use for herpes zoster. So it's left to the clinicians and, and their discretion pretty much and whatever is available in the hospital. And guess which one is the cheapest out of all these antiviral? <laughs> well, I'm <laughs> looking at it. how the most often used was one of the most often used was Foscarnet. Foscarnet. So I guess it was pretty exactly. cheap. It was, it was. And that's why it's their go-to because of cost. I mean, in this analysis, it's great because they're healthy patients or healthier patients and they got exposed to Foscarnet and they actually had the least incidence of AKI. But I think it's, it, we have to be very cautious how we apply this data and interpret this data when we are seeing our sick patients on the wards who don't have a GFR of 90, who are not hand-selected as they were in the study, because potentially then Foscarnet is not as safe as we see here in the study. You mentioned a good point. You're a clinical researcher. When I'm reading these trials and I'm thinking about um, retrospective analyses, I'm thinking there are reasons why we're choosing different drugs, which you mentioned cost was one, maybe how sick someone is. And that leads me to think there are some unmeasured confounders that could be contributing to why we're giving these drugs, which will alter the outcome. So what do they do to try to minimize that? And can you actually completely erase all of those unmeasured confounders? I wish. (laughs) I wish I can just completely erase it because I would be publishing golden results here (laughs) if I can erase (laughs) confounders. But no, I mean, you highlighted the fatal flaw of observational studies is that there's always unmeasured confounding. I mean, there's just something about when you walk into a patient's room and they look older than stated age and they just seem sick that you can't adjust for that, you know, that, that, that your gut feeling they're sicker. And as a clinician, obviously you're going to treat someone who you feel is sicker differently than someone who you feel is less sick, but the authors did try to get at that in, in all fairness. So they did have the Charleston comorbidity index. Um, and you see actually that it's fairly similar across the groups. They also have whether or not they were in the ICU, the length of stay, and the length of stay kind of shows that the Foscarnet group had the lowest length of stay. So again, potentially they're a less sick group, and that's why they got Foscarnet versus acyclovir. Other things are other toxins, like how many of them were on NSAIDs and diuretics. And they actually looked at that. And the group, again, that had the lowest exposure to NSAIDs, diuretics, PPIs, again, it's, you guessed it, that Foscarnet group. So I think we have to be very um, diligent in analyzing the data and how we apply it and highlighting that this is, again, the people who, who got the Foscarnet group are a different phenotype. They're healthier, potentially And maybe that's why we're seeing a lower incidence of AKI. Uh, They basically group these drugs into four different cohorts. So one group taking a cyclovir, valid cyclovir, they're considered the same. One group taking pencyclovir and famcyclovir, two drugs I've never heard of. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then the third one was gancyclovir. And then the fourth one was foscarnet. And in the crude hazard ratio, they basically showed that gancyclovir and foscarnet had a lower incidence of AKI. And of course, just to put that in quotations, most of that was stage one KDGO classification. After all the adjustments were done, the only one that came up as still being significant was foscarnet. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. And they did also combine because sometimes, again, you when the confidence interval is really wide, it potentially is because the sample size is small. And so what they did to try to see if that's the reason why they're not getting significant results is combining all the cyclovirs together and foscarnet and comparing that to acyclovir and val acyclovir because they consider the, the reference bad group. And when they did that, when they combined all the antivirals compared to receiving acyclovir, they did get independent associations. So the adjusted hazard ratio was 0.59. So you were about 40% less likely to develop AKI if you're exposed to other antivirals uh, as compared to being exposed to acyclovir or val acyclovir. That said, I mean, if you look at the upper limit of the confidence interval, it's 0.94. It's like itching to be one. (laughs) So (laughs) 
again, I, I'm not really sure, you know, how, how confident I am, especially with what we just mentioned, Matt, that again, it's just a different, there's a selection bias here. It's a different type of patient and a different phenotype than the patients we're seeing in our hospitals. When you look at randomized clinical trials, you go to clinicaltrials.gov and you see like, here's the outcomes we're going to look at. When you're looking at retrospective studies, I'm just uh, curious, are these a priori, like say, here's what we're going to do in the analysis and stick to it? Or can you sort of just mix and match things? I'm just curious how much of these things were pre-specified analyses versus massaging the data? I'm going to tell you my honest opinion. You never know because potentially, I mean, this is where ethically you should really write your honest hypothesis and what you're trying to test when you're publishing papers. But can you really tell? Like, unless the authors, you know, are being truthful and they say, yeah, this was a priori, we did define this and this is what we were going to look for in our analysis, you never really know, except if they were required to report it to clinical trials, because then you can see and you can track the progress. Because once you put it up there in clinical trials, every edit and every addition and every addendum, you could track and you could see that they really changed their a priori and, and what their original hypothesis was. I'm not sure if this I actually didn't look. I don't know if you, you see that this trial was in clinical trials and if we can track if all of these things. People do submit retrospective analyses to clinicaltrials.gov? Depending on where you are at Yale, it is encouraged. It's heavily regulated and it's a must if it's a clinical trial, but observational trials are also supposed to be recorded on clinicaltrials.gov. Again, this is just transparency. So, you know, or are you just fishing around and you're just publishing, you know, whatever significant results you get because you added this tiny confounder, you know, and then it somehow changed it, changed the math and you got these Again, statistically significant, like even, but clinically... Yeah, even having a priori for all of your confounders is it, exactly, uh, challenging. Exactly, exactly, yeah. I, I don't see that it's listed on there, but you know, it almost makes you think that they should have a separate like retrospective observations.gov. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Because you know, I think that's what ASN Kidney Translation Podcast is all about, is how do we take these findings and apply it to our patients? So I think that's what I want to do for each of these papers. How do we take this information and apply it to our patients? Yeah, um, I, I, I think that's a good point. To tell you the truth, I, I struggled a little bit, but I think I wanted to see more to bring this home to the bedside. So one thing I wanted to see a longer follow-up to kind of see what's happening to these AKI trends to help me again decide. I also wanted to see efficacy. How did these patients do with their herpes zoster and pain on a cyclovir versus foscarnet, let's say, because it would matter, you know, as, as I think we all know, it's an extremely painful disease process. And if your patient is like, it can't sit still because of the pain and, and one medication works better than the other, maybe you will tolerate stage one AKI, right? To get them to a better quality of life and resolution of their pain. And that's also saying that they truly did cause stage one AKI. Uh, very good point. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right. What about the safety of foscarnet and someone with normal kidney function? Is this enough to, to say that? I think we can say that in a healthy or a healthier phenotype of patients who have herpes zoster, foscarnet may be okay to use from an AKI perspective. At least over seven days. Over, exactly, with these limitations in mind. But another very important thing that I just want to bring up to our listeners is volume status, because with these acyclovirs and other cyclovirs, it's really important that we know what our patient's volume status is because we know that crystal saturation information happens more when you have low volume states. And we don't really have that data here. Uh, we do know that some patients are on diuretics and the patients that were exposed the least to diuretics were the ones, again, who, who received foscarnet. So again, potentially that's why we're seeing AKI in the other groups where they, you know, more dry. So it's just something to consider, I think, and that's a very important clinical factor when you're deciding these medications. And the other thing I think we should mention is that they also look not just at the PO route, but the IV route of these antivirals. And when, like you said, the crude associations, you know, showed that there were significant results, but 
in the IV group, even the adjusted hazard ratios for the subgroup of antivirals showed significant results. So Foscarnet as compared to acyclovir, you were, you know, 70% less likely to develop AKI and pencyclovir, gancyclovir, you were about 50% less likely to develop AKIs compared to receiving acyclovir. And that's in the IV group in the adjusted analyses. And I mean, I don't know about you, Matt, but like how, how often do you see IV acyclovir for herpes zoster? I can't say that I have a lot of experience with this. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> You know, I also say when we're seeing patients, at least in the kidney front, oftentimes they have a kidney transplant. They have a lot of other things going on. This is a really select group of individuals, many of which were admitted to the hospital just for herpes zoster, um, which is often not the case when we're seeing this in kidney patients. So I think that's another important point is that This is not your patient with significant CKD or having a kidney transplant. I loved your point to say, hey, how did these patients do? And that is also a really important determinant on which drug they might want to take. I would like to hear one of the things that sort of caught both of our attention is the fact that there's no good clinical guidance on which drugs to use in which clinical scenarios. So what could be done to improve that? Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, and the authors kind of mentioned in the discussion, Foscarnet was used because, again, it's left up to the clinician's discretion and they're just using what's available to them in hospitals, which just happens to be the cheapest drug out there. Now, in the U.S., I honestly had no idea what are the guidelines to treat herpes zoster, so I used our friend Google. And what I found is that um, uh, based on AAFP guidelines, it's also very vague. Like, they just tell you, hey, use POA cyclovir, but you can also use these other cyclovirs. Foscarnet is not as pushed or recommended in the guidelines, but there's no further detail. There's nothing about, well, which phenotype of patient would be a higher risk for, you know, some of the side effects of these drugs? You know, there's nothing at all mentioned about risk factors for AKI or chronic kidney disease. Thank you so much for spending the time with us oh, today. It's really my enjoyed. pleasure. <laughs> um, before we go, one thing that I really want to highlight is the, the lack of fellows going into research. You're very successful in your research career. You have a K-23. What's one piece of advice that you could tell trainees about pursuing a pathway in research? Yeah, I, I love that you're ending it this way because this is so close to my heart. I want everyone who's listening, especially the trainees, to know that I'm someone who actually would be uh, categorized as the person who hated research (laughs) before going into it. I just, it it felt like scut work. I was doing someone else's, you know, research and, and they were following their passion, but I was just along for the ride. And it wasn't until I was able to investigate my own questions. And and this is all thanks to Yale and Chirag Parikh and Perry Wilson, my mentors, where they allowed me and gave me a chance. Hey, Sherry, what are you interested in? What do you want to look into? And once you have that, like your your own question and that passion and it drives you, it's an indescribable feeling. It's amazing. It's amazing because you know that what you're doing from day to day might impact so many people if you're successful and it drives you. And I have to say, I also love the flexibility of academia. I think my lifestyle is great. So... (laughs) For any, you know, women, moms, dads, and, and you know, you just, I don't know, you, you don't have a patient waiting for you in clinic all the time. You can reschedule meetings sometimes to, I don't know, go drop your kid off to the doctor's office. And I, I just love it. I love it in terms of lifestyle, in terms of the intellectual drive and the joy that I get from it. And look, this fun podcast we put together, right? It's amazing. Totally agree. <laughs> so consider it. Don't say no until you've given it a try. Thanks to you and to our listeners, the ASN Kidney Translation Podcast. We will see you next time. This podcast is copyrighted by the American Society of Nephrology. All rights reserved. All content in this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be medical advice. This podcast should not be used in a medical emergency emergency 
or for the diagnosis or treatment of any medical condition. Please consult your doctor or other qualified healthcare professional if you have any questions about any medical condition or before taking any drug, changing your diet, or commencing or discontinuing any course of treatment. Thank you for listening to this podcast from the American Society of Nephrology.